The Seekers came into my life in the early 60s. They had a sound which was unique in any area of show business. People who are not like anyone else, they're the ones who deserve to succeed. The Seekers flew the flag for Australian music. They were the first major group to make it big in the UK. And I think it made people aware of the fact that the Australia did have actually a music industry. So let's give the Seekers a very cordial American welcome. So let's really hear it. Fabulous Seekers! There's a new world somewhere They call the promised land I don't think we truly understood that we'd sort of conquered the charts to the extent we had. Rivaling the Beatles? Our second single knocked the Beatles' ticket to ride off the top of the charts. And because we'd had the Georgie Girl hit, the press absolutely saw us as international stars. It wasn't plain sailing. Along the way, there's the usual disagreements or tensions that any group of four very different people are going to have and they produced moments of great drama at times. And certainly for me, it's a story of great redemption. It's just a very human story. We're having a little celebration today for Keith's birthday. It's about three years since we've all been together. Well, to have the four of us all together is quite a remarkable mm. thing, you know, really. It's been... I think there's been a, a, an indefinable bond between Judith Athel, Bruce and me. Well, hey, it's the cake, man. Oh, Fantastic. Hello. How lovely to see you all. Because we have uh, been through so many uh, experiences. Happy birthday, Happy birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. I think about my time with the Seekers in the 60s as being quite surreal. It was a bit hard to take it all in. You remember this car here? Oh, yeah. oh I do. My like pride and joy. Wow. I do. What is it? DB5 Aston Martin. Aston Martin. Well, you don't look any different, Ethel, except you've got no hair. <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> nice. I have no doubt that the thing that, that brought us together was the individual experience that we'd all had as kids growing up in Melbourne, out of the war years. Oh, there we go. Hey, hey, look. Oh, that's incredible. <laughs> Where music was the most uplifting thing you could get hold of. My first memories of, of music really were both singing and piano. You know, harmony around the piano with grandma. And, but I'd play piano for the girls to march in at school. I just knew from a very young age that Judy was most likely going to have a musical career. And by the time she was nine, she said to me, I'm going to be famous and I'm going to sing on all the stages around the world. Australia back in the 50s and 60s uh, was a very different Australia. A very important part of the entertainment at that time were the, uh, the jazz clubs. My sister Beverly and I both, we were frequenting the trad jazz clubs around Melbourne. And I went up and asked a band if I could sing with them. And it was quite late in the night. And uh, they said, oh, we'll come back next week. We did go back next week and she was up on the stage. I thought, wow, she's done it. And so from then on, they offered her a weekly job singing with the band. Keith and I got talking in had a group, uh, and we, we shared the you know, love of similar music. And we formed a group called the Escorts, four boys. Our own Escorts. <laughs> The early 60s was the golden time for television. Primarily because uh, the, the biggest thing on television was variety. Oh, 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 
the escorts kind of morphed into the Seekers. We started doing some folk songs. Ken Ray, when he decided to get married and leave the group, instead of looking around for a bloke, uh, we looked around for a girl. This train on Cano Extras, this train. This train. This train on Cano Extras, this train. This train. Well, when I first heard Judith Durham sing, I was absolutely knocked out. She was one of those voices that you could identify straight away. This train about the glory, this train. She was a girl with a wonderful voice uh, that made the Seekers uh, a totally different band. In 1964, Athel organised a trip for us on a ship called the Fair Sky to England. And our deal was that we would play on board the boat and stay there in England for 10 weeks and return back to Australia. I don't think I would have gone if I thought it was going to be more than 10 weeks. I was very much, you know, with my parents and I wasn't intending to leave home for a long time and I wasn't geared up for it. Our parents, they were quite worried, really, about her leaving with three boys because she was only about probably 19 then. We were in total wonderment. Suddenly we were in this incredible country. London at that time was the, uh, the swinging music capital of the whole universe, you know. There were the Beatles here, the Rolling Stones there, the Kinks, uh, all sort of solo artists like Dusty Springfield. Here's us as a straight Australian folk group. I guess we were so different, we were outrageous in our own way. My trend-setting idol was the Queen, so I'd have my matching handbag and matching gloves. I was not at all tuned into Carnaby Street. And uh, suddenly we found that we were right in the thick of it because we started working pretty much uh, as soon as we got off the ship. With my swag all on my shoulder, back belly in my hand. So this was, you know, so unexpected. And I had to ring my parents and say, oh, gosh, you know, I'm not coming back. I thought I'd perhaps go back to the piano and, and uh, my singing still. It was all sort of unfulfilled thoughts that I'd had. So it was a big thing to say, right, I'm going to be a full-time seeker. Oh, and some at Fiery Creek, I made a fortune in a day. We recorded a number of songs from our early days in Australia, but there really wasn't a lot of interest at that time. I think we needed something different musically. And that was where the connection with Tom Springfield was made. To you. Tom had a great understanding of what the group could achieve vocally, uh, musically. He'd had that experience with his own group with his sister Dusty called the Springfields who had a not dissimilar sound. Tom came round to meet us all, which was fabulous, and on a little piece of paper, I had written out the lyrics to I'll Never Find Another You. Abbey Road in those days, um, there was an upstairs and downstairs, and in the downstairs, huge studio was where the Beatles would record. So um, we record I'll Never Find Another You in that studio on the ground floor. I was lucky enough to work with uh, the Beatles, the Seekers, Cliff and the Shadows. What made the Seekers different, I think, was their blend of voices. Seekers was a new sound and people go, wow, what was that? We had Keith singing the high tenor part. He was a lot of times slightly sharp. Hope he won't mind me saying that. I was uh, the next voice down, the baritone, slightly under the note. I don't know what I do. Judith singing melody in a clear, tuneful voice and Athel always very tuneful down in the bottom end with the bass. Together, it produced a very unique, edgy vocal sound that not a lot of people could duplicate. 
Judith was, I think, a perfectionist. So she wanted her vocal to be absolutely right. And if that didn't happen or she wasn't happy, uh, I think she used to get upset. All of us have our ideas about how a song, words and music should go. So very often I'd want to, you know, say, oh, no, I really think it should go like this. I'd drive the boys potty, as I still do today, I think. Judith always felt upset that there was a flat note in I'll Never Find Another You, which we always jibe her about. But as I say, we all, we all felt stressed in our recording career. This is Radio Caroline on 199, England's first commercial radio station. The Seekers had just recorded I'll Never Find Another You, but they couldn't get uh, anyone to hear it because the BBC would not play songs until they became hits. There was no commercial radio in, in the UK. So the Seekers got their start through pirate radio because nobody else would play their songs. We were at EMI's offices and the door just about crashed off its hinges as the team out there came in shouting, you're number one, you're number one, you're number one. And we went, we are number one. <laughs> How do we do that? Well, the success of that record led to uh, Eddie Jarrett, our manager, uh, coming to us and saying, we've got a four-year record deal with EMI in the offing and that we should seriously uh, do it. So I thought, oh, this doesn't seem like a good enough deal, you know, it was a too very low royalty. And uh, anyway, I was a bit... Um, distraught at the time, you know, because I didn't really feel comfortable about signing the contract. For me, four years felt like a long, long time. There is no doubt that in those days you never got anything out of your first contract. And that's what happened to us. So you had to wait for the second contract, you know, to get the bonus. The pressure was always on after the first hit to come up with another one. We'd like to sing for you now a song that we hope will be nearly as successful as I'll Never Find Another You. That's a song written for us again by Tom Springfield. It was released last Friday. It's called A World of Our Own. Just after I'll Never Find Another You, the New Musical Express announced that the Seekers have been named the top best new group, which was fantastic because the group that won it the year before was the Rolling Stones, and the group that won it the year before them was the Beatles. Of course, we went to the big pole winners concert. So Rolling Stones were on, the Beatles, and, you know, and there we were. Little seekers, I mean, blimey, you know. And there I am in my homemade dress, you know. <laughs> it's classic, isn't it? But here are the world's greatest and... <laughs> the Beatles! We were in our dressing rooms on the day of the concert uh, and Eddie, our manager, was standing out outside the dressing room and John Lennon walked across to him with a very cheeky grin on his face and said, they're not a bad little band, you know, but they're all here to see us. Uh, things worked out pretty well. We evened the score by knocking Ticket to Ride off the top of the charts. Our first tour back in Australia was phenomenal. The streets were just lined with people everywhere we went. People in Australia who thought that we're second class in most things, all of a sudden they saw a group of Australians have success the likes of which we'd not seen before. How did you all feel when you knocked the Beatles off the, the, the top of the popularity chart? Keith? Oh, they were pretty tired when we knocked them off, mate. You know, they'd, been there. <laughs> they'd been there for about five or six weeks. It was pretty heavy going because we'd had to do all the interviews and do the shows and everything. Do you think the time will ever come when Australian artists won't have to go to Europe to become recognised? 10 or even 20 years time, but I should imagine Australia is going to expand so much that show business life must expand too. We finished in Australia and then we went on to America. Yes, yeah, so there was hardly time, though, to appreciate what was happening. 
After we arrived back in London, we had a 16-week summer season in Bournemouth. Sadly, Judith came down with an illness. It had been such a whirlwind. Coming back, and then the very next day started rehearsals. Nothing felt right, and I just felt embarrassed and, and awkward about everything. I had been suffering from nervous exhaustion, but, you know, nobody sort of knew that at this time, and so it was pretty, um, pretty heavy going, and, uh, yeah, so anyway, I was... They said I needed five weeks' rest. I think the initial success and the constant media attention got all a bit much for Judith. It was a hell of a challenge, you know, being the front girl in a, a group, and you know, easy for the three blokes. You know, quite easy for us. I was very uncomfortable in my body. I was always wondering, you know, what was I going to do about my weight? And in fact, I went and spoke to a plastic surgeon, you know, because I thought I needed a bust reduction operation. I asked that same doctor, could you also take some, uh, I need, I want hollow cheeks. So, you know, because I, when I was a child, I, was, I used to sit in the cinema and draw my cheeks in, you know, to, to hoping they'd stay in. You know? So I was so self-conscious. While we were at the, uh, at the uh, pavilion in Bournemouth doing that long season, um, Tom had been um, working on other material. Tom always had a, a, a lovely way of presenting his demos. It was so different to the other songs. It was based on a Russian folk tune. Say goodbye, my own true love. I absolutely loved The Carnival Is Over. It was so emotional. At that time, on the cover of Vogue, there was a pair of uh, leather, white leather boots, and I said to myself, I'm going to buy those boots if we get to number one. And of course, it went to number one, and uh, I bought my boots, so that was good. <laughs> After 18 months, the Seekers had chalked up three number one hits with their first three singles. That was amazing. That was unheard of. And there's more to come. Our next hit song was really going to come out of left field because it came from a request from some film producers who were putting a movie together called Georgie Girl and they wanted the Seekers to record the title track. Hey there, Georgie girl, swinging down the street so fancy free. The story of the film is about a girl who is really pretty unsure of herself and, and, uh, and a bit um, introspective. Georgie girl, look at all the boyfriends you don't get. I so much related to her because she was so body conscious and washed her hair out in the ladies' room because she wasn't happy with how the hairdresser had done it. It was really so much I related to it. It was just extremely well written. It became a huge hit in America. This is the number one song. The Academy Awards had been announced and the song Georgia Girl was nominated. But the awards ceremony happened at precisely the same time as we were doing the pantomime in Bristol. We tried to get out of the contract and they just wouldn't let us out of it. That was hugely disappointing to us. Anyway, Mitzi Gaynor, God bless her, stepped up to the plate to sing the song. And it wasn't exactly as you'd probably want Georgia Girl to be sung, but that was Mitzi's. First, the Seekers and their one-hour colour special. Here are the Seekers making their film on location at the Sydney Opera House. What you 1967 was a very big year for us. When we were there on the Opera House site, it was just building materials and rubble everywhere.
We won the accolade of Australians of the Year, which was an incredible honour. We got to meet up with John Gordon, uh, our then Prime Minister, and his wife Bettina, and spent a great day at the Lodge in Canberra with them. We were to do uh, a Music for the People concert at the Maya Music Bar. Well, before we went out on stage for the concert, we were told there was massive crowds. We had no idea. If you can imagine, a concert by the Seekers drew 200,000 people. And when it was included in their television special, the ratings for that night broke a record which has never been achieved again. I can seem to get my sleep now in the old night. I had no real idea of the future at that point. I was thinking that it could go on for some long time. There was no real thought that uh, things might change in, in the near future. You taught me to understand. Look, I, I was always receiving requests to go solo. I was wondering when will my time with the band come to an end. It was a safety net. We could have gone on and on and on, and I just was thinking, well, I really have to do something to make a move. I found that artistically I wasn't quite on the same page as the boys. For me, it was quite difficult to, if things weren't done, to perfection. I remember we were in New Zealand and, and the curtain was drawn and we weren't ready. And I just really felt, oh, look, I really feel I need to just do my own thing. Look, I knew uh, Judith had aspirations to being a solo performer at some point. I just never knew it was so far advanced in her thinking at the time. I was quite taken aback by it, actually. I was disappointed, not only for myself, but for the group, because the group could have gone on for years at that level and developed musically. So that spelt the end of a lot of aspirations for me. You know, it's not something you welcome with open arms. You know, go, wow, we're breaking up. And at that time, we were going to be offered a new contract with EMI that would have meant a lot to us financially as well, so that never happened. Well, the timing was pretty bad in terms of us getting that huge bonus that we would have picked up in terms of our second contract. I was grateful to be out of obligation. It was pretty hard because we were offered, oh, serious, like it was a big contract, was a big, big thing to make that decision. And for me, money has never been the object. So um, my whole life changed within a matter of days and the Seekers' uh, days were over for me. And that is from all of us very, very sincerely. Thank you, thank you very, very much. And goodbye, because I'm afraid tonight the carnival really is over. We went into the BBC studios and recorded the farewell concert. They had over 10 million people viewing. The feeling of our fans was one of devastation, despair. How could they do this? Uh, very hard to just simply explain. Uh, and, and, yeah, it's always hard to explain. It's just, it's a moment that you come to accept and, uh, and you move on. And uh, we all sort of picked ourselves up. You know, Keith started another group, which really didn't need to be called the New Seekers. I do remember at the time not feeling that positive about it, and Keith knows this, but we weren't about to go 
suing one of our mates. And... I don't think initially they were all that thrilled, but the fact that we came up with a with a stonking great group was um, was the best way that we could keep the Seeker's name alive. And here's our host, Ethel Guy. <laughs> Ethel went on to host a TV quiz show, and then he became a state member of parliament for the Liberal Party and won three elections in a row. Bruce Woodley pursued his songwriting career and wrote the classic song, I Am Australian. I am, you are, we are Australia. Oh, won't you come along with me? Judith married the musician Ron Edgeworth and pursued a solo career as a jazz singer. We'll take a boat to the land of dreams. We'll steam down the river down to New Orleans. Despite their individual successes, I don't believe they were ever as good as when they combined those voices. Where old friends always meet. I wrote a letter to Judith years after we broke up because uh, I didn't feel easy in my heart about carrying feelings of resentment, particularly towards Judith. I just wanted her to know, from my point of view, how much that breakup had affected me and, and, and caused me a lot of hurt. And I couldn't believe what he was saying. I never thought for a million years that they would have thought that I'd turned their, my back on them. You know, I'd given notice to them. And, but I thought everybody was feeling fine. What happened to the Seekers, Judy? Well, I think they're still going with a different kind of members in them. They've been sort of on and off for all the years, you know, since I left. Out of the blue, uh, you know, fate steps in and, you know, pushes you into a, a point where you really you need to connect with your, with your friends again. Judith Durham, one of Australia's first singing superstars, will survive the fatal car crash which killed a woman passenger in the other car. In 1990, Judith and her husband, Ron Edgeworth, were involved in a terrible car accident that was not their fault. That was the starting point, I suppose. We all got together and, and had a bit of a dinner and, uh, and chatted about old times, etc. It was so great to see the boys, of course, you know, when we walked in, big hugs, all of us. And when I saw Bruce, I, I just said to him, look, I'm really sorry if I've ever hurt you. And I thought, what an incredibly brave thing to say. And I told her that and I, I said, you know what, the moment you said that to me, it was all gone. Uh, and then uh, the idea came up that, you know, we hadn't been together for nearly 25 years, so we should have a, a Silver Jubilee reunion concert. And uh, we thought we'd better sit down and have a bit of a sing-along, make sure we could, we could still do it in the manner that everybody had become accustomed to years before. And they wanted a studio, a low-profile studio that they could come to and just test the waters. One of the golden oldies, the olden goldies. Certainly a little tentative in every regard. <laughs> 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 It was an extraordinary moment because it was the first time those four voices had come together to sing in a generation. I was a witness to a moment of Australian music history. And I've got to tell you, it was like we hadn't been apart for 25 years. It was just a, a wonderful thing. In 1993, we started our Silver Jubilee tour. We ended up doing 120 concerts. It was just extraordinary when we walk out on stage and just stand there and people would just applaud for five, six minutes. For 25 years now, uh, since 93, because the phones keep ringing, we've done, you know, four or five uh, other tours. We knew that we were getting towards the golden mark, the 50 years. We wanted to celebrate it because the fact we were all still alive after 50 years was so amazing. I 
I doubt if there'll ever be another reunion, but uh, I think that the fans themselves, even when we last went to the Royal Albert Hall concert, the fans were saying goodbye. I'd like the Seekers to be remembered as a group who brought some joy and light into people's lives, uh, while at the same time having a lot of fun together. I hope our music over the years has given people a sense of place and belonging. This will be our last goodbye. I don't want us to be remembered uh, in any particular way. I, I just want us to be remembered <laughs> and the music to be treasured. And uh, I'm just going to be out there for a long, long time. <laughs>